Bezos theorem is a very important theorem in number theory that underpins so many results, but many people don't learn it. And in this video, I'm going to explain it to you super intuitively. So you really master it by the end of this 10 minute video. How cool is that? So let's just dive into it. So Bezos theorem tells us that let A and B be integers. And I'll show you an example of it right after I say the statement. If D is the greatest common divisor of A and B, that is the largest integer that goes into both A and B, then in that case, we can write D as the sum of a multiple of A plus a multiple of B. Okay, so here we can write it in the form AX plus BY, where X and Y are integers. Okay, we can write the greatest common divisor as a sum in this form. So let's actually look at some examples. So an important example is when A and B are relatively prime. That means they don't have any common divisor other than one. I'll give you an example of such numbers. Let's look at seven and 23. Okay, so seven and 23, seven and 23 are both prime numbers. So they are relatively prime. They don't have any common divisor except for one. And Bezos theorem says we can write the greatest common divisor D, which is one. We can write it in the form seven X plus 23 Y. So how do we actually find the X and Y to do this? Okay, so that's what we're going to have to think about. So one way I like to do it very naively and we'll get to the proof, which will make it very rigorous. But the naive way, and the proof will give an algorithm as well, okay? So it'll be a fail-safe method to actually do this whenever. But the naive way is we just want to find a multiple of seven and a multiple of 23 that are one apart, okay? And once we've done that, we can find our X and Y. So let's think about our multiples of 23. Well, you've got 23, you've got 46, you've got 69, etc. And I'm gonna stop right there because actually that's enough. 23 is two away from 21. So it's not one apart from a multiple of seven. 46 is also going to be three away from 49. So it's not one apart from a multiple of seven, but 69 is because 69 plus one is 70. So what that means is that if you look at that 69, we can write it out as seven times 10 minus 23 times three. Okay, so this is going to be 70 minus 69, which is equal to one. So here we've taken X is equal to 10 and we've taken Y is equal to three. So that's going to be an option, okay? X equals 10 and Y equals three. Now there are other options, okay? There are other possibilities for X and Y. Drop a comment down below. Try to explain to me what the possible X's and Y's are. And you may want to watch the whole proof for that or you can play around with it right now just to really practice the math. Um, find out all the X and Y's and try to understand that. That's a side quest of the Bezos theorem. But what we're gonna do now is just get into the proof and I'm gonna actually tell you one other aspect of Bezos theorem I haven't stated is what are these numbers AX plus BY? What are all these numbers that are of the form a multiple of A plus a multiple of B? So actually those numbers all have to be multiples of D, the greatest common divisor. So why is that? So let's explain that right now. Okay, so if we look at numbers of the form AX plus BY, so AX plus BY, then we know that the greatest common divisor D is a divides A, goes into A, so it goes into AX, right? If A is a multiple of D, AX is a multiple of D. And similarly, because B is a multiple of the greatest common divisor, BY is also a multiple of the greatest common divisor. So in other words, AX plus BY is always a multiple of the greatest common divisor. And we want to actually show that we can find an example of such an AX plus BY that's exactly D, not 2D, 3D, 5D, whatever, but exactly D. Okay, and the rigorous argument to show this is a multiple of D is just say that since D divides A, DE is going to equal to A for some E, and DF is going to equal to B for some, some F. So, so I can write this out as for some um, E and F. And then what I can do is I can just say that D times EX plus FY is then going to equal to, well, DE is going to be A and DF is going to be B, so this is going to be AX plus BY. So there you see that AX plus BY is always a multiple of D. Okay, I just wrote out the rigorous proof just to practice with the mathematical proofs. So let's now prove that we can always find an X and Y so that AX plus BY is exactly D, which is pretty cool. Okay, so let's actually do that right now. So I'm just gonna erase this again. All right, so let's now get into it. So how do we actually write D as an expression AX plus BY? So we're gonna do a kind of a non-constructive proof, but the proof is going to actually be possible to made into an algorithm. And I'll explain that next. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the set S, which consists of all numbers of the form AX plus BY, such that AX plus BY is greater than zero. Okay, so, so we look at the set of all numbers of the form AX plus BY, where AX plus BY is greater than zero, and this is a subset of the natural numbers. Okay, so all the numbers one, two, three, four, etc. 
and therefore it has a minimal element. Okay, this is what's called the well ordering principle. Any non empty subset of the rational of the natural numbers has a smallest element, and that smallest element we want to show is d. Okay, it has to be d because all these elements are multiples of the greatest common divisor, as I just explained. We want to show d is actually achieved, but we don't know that yet. Okay, so let, let's call this um, let's call this smallest element. Let's call it z. Okay, so let z equals to a x plus b y be the smallest element um, of s. Now, what's interesting is that this element of s. Okay, it's the smallest element. It has to be less than or equal to a, and it has to be less than or equal to b, right? Because if you take x equals one and y equals zero, then basically a is in s. And you know, if you take x equals zero and y equals one, you know b is in s. So you know that the smallest element of s has to be less than or equal to both of them. So z has to be less than or equal to a, and z has to be less than or equal to b. Now, what's interesting is, is, is if z actually was going into both a and b, if z is a factor of both a and b, then z has to be a factor of the greatest common divisor. z has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor. And we know that all the elements of s are multiples of the greatest common divisor, so z has to actually be the greatest common divisor. So that case is fine. Okay, so we know that, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume without loss of generality. So assume that, so I'm going to write it as follows. Assume that z is not a factor of a. And this is without loss of generality, which I write as w log. Okay, so why is that? Because as I just explained, if z is a factor of both a and b, it has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor, which is by definition, the largest factor of a and b. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that, if z is not a factor of one of the two, let's assume a by symmetry, pick one, a. Um, and we're going to use that z is not a factor of a to find a smaller element of s, which will be a contradiction. So let's do that on this side of the board. I'm going to erase Bezos' theorem statement. All right, so let's assume we know z is not a factor of a, and we're going to now use that. So we're going to use the Euclidean algorithm. Okay, so I'll show you there's a proof of the Euclidean algorithm. I'll direct you to that in the next video. But we all know the Euclidean algorithm intuitively. So the Euclidean algorithm basically says that if z is not a factor of a, we know z is less than a, right? Uh, in that situation because it's not a factor of a and so we can divide z into a right and we can do a long division and we'll get a remainder so we can write a is going to equal to zq plus r right so z is going to go into a with some remainder r and r is going to have the property that r is going to be um, less than or equal to greater than or equal to zero and less than z okay in general but in this case we know that z is not a factor of a so we can assume that r the remainder is actually greater than zero and of course it's less than z Okay, so if it's exactly equal to z, then we could say that z is a factor of a, right? So we know we've got this situation. And now with this situation, we can now think about this z, okay? We know it's a number of the form ax plus by because it's in s. And actually we know a is a number of the form ax plus by. a is also in s because it's a times one plus b times zero. So therefore r also has to be in that form. And here's how that works. Well, basically therefore, um, r is equal to a minus zq, which is equal to a minus, so let's say we know z is in s, so let's say z is equal to ax prime plus um, by prime times q, and now we can write this out again as a number of the form ax plus by, just by grouping like terms, okay, group the multiples of a and the multiples of b, so we're going to get a times 1 minus x prime q, and we're going to get minus, so I'm going to write this as plus b times minus y prime q. Okay, so therefore it's of the form a times something plus b times something, which is in s, but we know that we have chosen z to be the smallest member of s. That's impossible because r is less than z and r is now in s. That's a contradiction. So that means that uh, our proof is complete because we've got a contradiction. We assume that you know z is either not a factor of a or not a factor of b. That assumption is false. So that, that means that z is going to be a factor of both of them. So therefore z has to be less than or equal to the greatest common divisor and equal to the greatest common divisor because every element of s is a multiple of the greatest common divisor. Okay, so that's the proof. And for, for the Euclidean algorithm, for the rigorous proof of this and just more mathematical proofs, I'll direct you to that video next. But I want to actually show how you can use this proof to actually find the x and y in a concrete situation, okay? And I want you to practice more with this as well yourself. So I'm gonna erase this, show you one example, and all the examples are gonna be here very similarly, okay? But let's just do this one example. Also, if you're loving my content so far, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference to my channel. You know, every like helps the algorithm reach more people. Every comment helps the algorithm reach more people. You don't have to comment if you don't want to, but I do love hearing from you. 
and it just means the world. And if you want to support my channel further, please consider checking out the links in the description, either joining as a YouTube channel member or on Patreon. Um, there's a link in the description. Makes a huge difference. I'm super grateful to Alex and Nathan for their support and Enehota Ney JR for their support as a YouTube channel member. Alex and Nathan for their support on Patreon. Makes a huge difference and really helps this channel keep growing. So thank you so much to everyone for watching and liking and supporting in general. And let's do a one, one last example with the Bezos theorem to actually show you how it works. So I'm gonna look at the numbers 25 and 16. Okay, so 25 and 16, um, it's an example where they are relatively prime because 25 and 16, um, 25 is five squared, 16 is four squared, they don't have any prime number in common. You can write them as five squared and two to the four, so you can see they have no prime factor in common. These are the prime decompositions. And we're going to write one as a linear combination of the form ax plus by, okay? So where a is 25 and b is 16. So how are we going to do this? So we're going to actually make this proof into a, an algorithm, and this is super co cool and important to know. So the first step is we're going to keep getting smaller and smaller numbers in the form 25x plus 16y, okay? So just like the proof kind of did, we sort of took a smallest number and then we made something even smaller, right? So we're gonna keep going smaller and smaller until we hit a dead end, and that dead end is going to be one, okay? So that's what an algorithm is, basically. It terminates. So 25 minus 16 is nine, okay? So we've, we basically, we're going to use the Euclidean algorithm. We're gonna divide 16 into 25. We know that the remainder is nine. So we get the equation 25 minus 16 is nine. Okay, so we're using the Euclidean algorithm at each step. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at nine. So we know nine is of the form 25x plus 16y. Okay, we've written it exactly in that form. Now we're going to look at 16 and nine. So I'm gonna move the 16 and nine here, and I'm going to now write 16, make nine go into 16 using the Euclidean algorithm. So 16 minus nine is equal to seven. So again, like in these cases, the multiple of nine that we need to go into 16 is one. So we're just getting a straight equation like this, but we'll see down the road, we'll see a case where it's a higher multiple. But again, you've got 16 minus nine is seven. And the principle here is that nine is of the form 25x plus 16y. And then 16 and nine are both of that form. So therefore seven is also going to be of that form. Right, so we're going to keep getting smaller and smaller numbers of the form 25x plus 16y. So now we put nine and seven. So we write nine and seven here. What multiple of seven goes into nine? Well, again, it's seven times one is the maximum that goes into nine. So nine minus seven is two. Okay, so we're getting smaller and smaller numbers. You know, think about it. Basically, we've written nine as a, of the form, a multiple of 25 plus a multiple of 16. So then 16 minus nine, 16 is a multiple of 16, and nine is a multiple of 25 plus a multiple of 16. So this combination is also a multiple of 25 plus a multiple of 16. And then you've got the seven, and then again, you know, nine is a multiple of 25 plus a multiple of 16, seven is two, so the difference is also so, so far we have theoretically written down two as a multiple of 25 plus a multiple of 16. And I'll concretely explain, you know, how we can actually write the X and Y, but let's finish it. Let's now get seven and two. So now seven, what is the, how do you divide two into seven? Well, you have to do two times three. Okay, so this is where the Euclidean algorithm comes in. Two times three is the maximal multiple of two that goes into seven. So seven minus two times three is one. So now theoretically we have written one as a multiple of 25 plus a multiple of 16, but how do you actually see it from this? Okay, so here's how you see it. I'm gonna do it on that side of the board. And I want you to think about practicing this with some cases too. All right, so try to do it yourself now that you've seen this. Um, just try to practice because it stays in your memory more, but I'm gonna actually do it now. So basically we're going to do it one by one. So we're gonna write, we're gonna plug in the equations one by one. Okay, so we're gonna write 25 minus 16 is nine. Okay, so we've got 25 minus 16 is nine. We're gonna plug that into the second equation. Okay, so we get 16 minus 25 minus 16 is going to equal to seven. Okay, that's number one. Okay, we plugged in the first equation into the nine here. But now we've got seven as a combination of multiples of 16 and 25. So now we're going to put that into this equation and we're gonna put the nine in. Okay, so nine minus seven is two. So nine is 25 minus 16. Okay, so 25 minus 16. And then you're going to subtract off seven, which we know is going to equal to 16 minus 25 minus 16. So I'm gonna write this as 16 minus 25 minus 16. Okay, so that's going to equal to two. Okay, so now we've got that far. And now we've got all that. Okay, so it's gonna get a little complicated where we've got that far. Now we're gonna write one. Okay, as a combination of a multiple of 25 and a multiple of 16. 
We've written two as such a combination. If you unentangle this, it's going to be a multiple of 25 plus a multiple of 16. So let's actually now write, we know 7 how to do that. So now we can subtract the 2. So what I'm going to do is just to make things very easy at this step, I'm just going to actually simplify these two equations. So this is going to be 16 plus 16 minus 25. Okay, so we can write this as 2 times 16 um, minus 25. So I'm going to write as plus minus 1 times 25 is equal to 7. And here for 2, um, well, you could actually do the same thing. So just actually calculate it out. So you're going to get um, 25 uh, minus what multiple of 25 is going to be here? It's going to be negative 1 times 25. So it's going to be plus. Okay, so I'm doing everything in my head. So it's going to be um, 2 times 25. So I'll write this out as 2 times 25. And then you have the negative 16, negative of what multiple of 16? Negative 2 times 16. So it's going to be negative 3 times 16. Okay, so I'm going to write this as negative 3 times 16. And that, that plus is going to equal to 2. And then you're going to subtract 7 minus 3 times this. That's going to be 1. Okay, so you can actually sort of compare the like terms again. And um, you're going to get, and if you have a faster way, drop a comment down below. I'm just showing you the naive way. If you have a trick that makes it faster, think about how to do that. That's really cool. So now we subtract off 3 times. So we're going to get minus 3 times this. So it's going to be minus 3 times minus 3 is 9. 2 plus 9, which is going to be 11. So you're going to get 11 times 16. And then again, 7 minus 3 times 2. So 3 times this 2 times 15, 25 is 6 times 25. Minus 1 minus 6 is going to be minus 7. So you're going to get um, minus 7. So you're going to get, let's say, plus minus 7 times 25. And that's going to equal to 1. Okay, And you can actually work this out. Again, okay? we could have figured this out faster if you try to find multiples of 16. But this way, you get 11 times 16 which is going to be 176 minus uh, 7 times 25, which is going to be 175. So 176 minus 175 is 1. So there you have it. And practice this. You know, Just play around with it. It's super fun. If you can find other examples, try to play around with it, try to find fast ways of doing it. That's what math is all about. You know, Trying to get formulas and nice expressions for things. And also think about you know, how do you actually find all the x's and y's? You know, what are all the, we found x is 11 and y is negative 7. Give 16x plus 25y is 1. Are there other x's and y's, and how do you actually study them? I'd love to hear your thoughts below. It really helps to think with this stuff. Have, a, have an amazing day. Check out my video. Okay, it's on the Euclidean algorithm. It's a proof of the Euclidean algorithm. You're going to love it. And here's another fun video. If you're enjoying number theory a lot, you're going to love this one. It's related to the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, it's very special. It's a proof that uh, the harmonic numbers, 1 plus half plus 1 third, etc., up to 1 over n, are never integers. And this is actually deeply connected to the most famous unsolved problem in math. Check out that video here. Have an amazing day. Wish you all the best. 